chapter 15 today. Um, can you believe we made it through 15 weeks of our series, Christ Our Righteousness? Amen. This week we'll see Paul continued in the same direction that we've seen over the past couple chapters, how we're to live, how we're to live our daily lives in light of what we know about Christ and what we know about Christ being our righteousness. He continues to give us daily, I, I call it a mosaic description. I love our stained glass windows. When you look at one little piece of glass, it's not that pretty, but when you put them all together and you step back from it, you see a beautiful mosaic uh, picture of uh, the, the window there. And that's kind of the way Paul is talking here. He's taking little pit, pit uh, bits of our life, putting them together, and as you step back a little bit, you see a mosaic of what our life will look like when we're living from the source who is Jesus Christ, when we're living from the truth that he is our righteousness. Uh, so he begins to sum up his letter in this chapter, chapter 14, we're going to look at. But let's look again at our theme passage, Romans chapter 1, verse number 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it is a righteous of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. All right. And so last week we learned about Paul, how he would direct us to see Christ living through us in regards to dealing with others who believe or think differently than us. That's probably as humankind it's probably the hardest thing for us to get over is dealing and taking, talking and hanging out and, and working alongside people who think different than we do, who look different than we do, who have different backgrounds than we do. Uh, that's why we have different countries. That's why we have different uh, nationalities. That's why we have different, if you go to New York, you'll see uh, a 100% Hasidic Jew area and then a whole Puerto Rican area and a whole uh, you know, Cambodian area, and, and you just that's all together because people like to hang out with people that look like them, talk like them, and, and act like them. But in the church, it's difficult because in the church, we're all to be one in Christ, uh, no matter what race or nationality, background, language, uh, age, nothing. We should all be one in Christ, and that's very difficult for us. So, Paul spent an entire chapter and kind of used this, some of this chapter even to talk about these differences. And so we saw that, uh, specifically verse number uh, 9 and 10, for to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. So why do you judge your brothers, or why do you despise your brothers? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It is in Christ that unites us in life and death. Ultimately, all believers will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For Samuel says in chapter 16, God looks on the heart, man looks on the outward appearance. So why do we judge people today? We judge them harsher than Christ would judge them, especially if we're looking at people within the church. Our focus for those within the church, they are in Christ. God has welcomed them. So stop judging them and go live life together. That's what Paul is saying. And Paul uses these dietary issues of the day to illustrate this. Verse 14 and 15. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it's unclean. If your brother is grieved because of your food, you're no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with the food for one whom Christ died. Man, it's a tremendous passage there. And the freedom and liberty that we have, we know that there are things that we can do that are okay. But someone that you're in community with, someone that you're serving God together with, right, may be struggling or may feel differently about that. We see too many selfish or prideful believers in our churches today. So don't destroy their walk with Christ while they're trying to figure it out just so that way you can say, well, I can, so deal with it, right? That's selfishness. So let's dive into chapter 15 and see where Paul takes us today. Chapter 15, verse number one. We who are strong ought to bear the weakness of the weak and not please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. Here he is continuing the discussion about how we are to treat the weaker brethren. 
But first we have to go back to chapter 14 and remember the weaker brethren is. It's not what most of the Christian church think. The weaker one who is the one living their life in bondage to the law. Living their life in bondage to the letter of the law, not the spirit. Living their life in bondage to the high standards that they have set for themselves in their lives. And judging everyone else in the church and outside the church by those standards that they set for themselves. Even in light of someone showing them scripture that says the opposite, the weaker brethren will always uh, come back to what they believe and what they think is true, even if it's contrary to scripture. And so what he's saying here is we who are strong, we who have the freedom of Christ, who understand the scripture of the, of the that we're no longer in the bondage anymore to the law, we who are strong ought to bear the weakness of the weak. So they're weak. We shouldn't be like making fun of them, getting mad at them, or uh, calling them names, or, you know, we should bear their weakness. In other words, we should uh, it, uh, uh, uplift them and encourage them. We who are strong, right? That's what it says. We're judging everyone. Now, um, years ago, when I first started pastoring, uh, I was taught that uh, churches are to have what is called closed communion. And what that means is only members of that local church could participate in the communion service. And so uh, we were taught that you were to do it on a Sunday night where the visitors aren't there, or you're supposed to do it maybe on a Tuesday night. I actually had friends that would do this on an off night, give invitations to only church members and not tell the non-church members that are coming about the Lord's Supper, because only those. So we were taught that growing up, and uh, or you know, in my uh, learning process. Now I always struggled with it, but I did it because that's what I was taught. And uh, so when I went off to Utah, I started the church, and we continued that tradition of a closed communion church. And so there was a lady who visited with us, and I took the stand that I would teach it that it was closed, but if you took it contrary to the way my teaching was, then that's on you, not on me. Um, and so I wouldn't tell people like when they walk in the door. I actually had friends that would tell people walk in the door, you can't come in today, we're having communion. All right. And uh, so I didn't go that far, but I still taught it. Well, I had this lady uh, say that she wasn't coming back to church uh, one time, and I went by her house, and I said, uh, why are you not going to be coming back, whatever? She said, because you're close communion stance. Now, me being the pastor that I am and the type of person that I am, that some of y'all know I am, um, I did have a scripture reason for it, but it still wasn't um, solidified in my mind, but at least I had some scripture to back it up. And I said, do you have any scripture to show me why what I'm doing is wrong when I have a scripture verse that shows it's right? And she goes, no, it's just what I think. Now for me, I'm like, okay, it's what you think. I'm fine with that but I have scripture, you don't have scripture. Now, in that moment, I didn't realize it, but I was the weaker brother, right? I was holding to a standard that I had set that really wasn't scriptural, but I thought it was. Now, I've only been pastoring for like a year, like 20 some years ago, so uh, don't judge me, all right? So, now this lady had been going to churches before that didn't teach that way. She didn't know why, she just knew it was wrong. So when the stronger, right, which would have been her technically, right, comes to the weaker, instead of just attacking or saying, I'm not coming to your church anymore or whatever, if she had brought me scripture to show me, maybe I would have listened and heard, right? Maybe, right? I'm saying maybe because I'm being honest with myself the way I typically am. It, it's... Uh, much better now than I used to be. Let's just put it that way, right? And um, and I was a new pastor starting off, you know, and I was like, everything I was doing was right, you know? And uh, God beat me on the head about four or five years later, literally. Um, I was like completely done. I said, I can't do this anymore. I cannot live up to the, all the standards that I had placed in my life. And no one in my church can either. So why am I even doing this? And I quit. Like, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to be a pastor. And I'm not even sure if I want to be a Christian. Right? And I was like that down. And I had a pastor reach out to me and say, don't quit yet. Let's talk. 
And we began having breakfast and lunch and different things with that. And he began sharing me the grace of Christ and the new covenant message. And once I began hearing it, at first I thought it was all wrong. Like, it's all heretic. It's wrong, right? right? But he was bringing me scripture, right? So I had to at least dive into it. So as I was diving into the scripture, I realized that the only thing that I knew that was right that I've been teaching is that Jesus Christ is my Savior. And anything else I've been teaching is pretty much probably wrong. Um, and I began an entire new journey of understanding Scripture, including the close communion. And so now I don't believe that anymore. I don't believe in close communion. And I see it in Scripture, actually, that I was wrong. Now, I still had that one Scripture verse that I could use if I needed to. But it was out of context. Now I know that, right? And so I'm just being transparent with you guys. I understand about being the weaker brethren and the stronger brethren, right? And I try to learn from that in uh, seeing people who are weaker. Now, my personality is one that is very passionate about what I believe. So I will tell you this, that if there's ever a time where you're trying to show me that I'm actually the weaker brother and you're the right one because you have the stronger scripture, I would love for you to tell it to me, but you may hit me on the head with the Bible first and tell me to shut up and just listen, right? And, and I'll be like, okay, I'll listen, right? So I'm saying that is because whenever we're discussing scripture, we're gonna have differences. And whenever one person feels like they're the stronger one or the weaker one, we gotta be careful. We may be the one who's the weaker, right? And if we're the weaker, we gotta be willing to listen. But the one who's stronger, according to this scripture says, to bear that burden. So what if someone came alongside me and said, Pastor, I think you're wrong, but I love you, I support you. We're gonna, we're gonna pray for you and I'm gonna encourage you and help you all along the way. And if there's any way I can uh, help you learn, I want to help you. Wow. Like to have a church member do that would be amazing, right? Uh, to have another brother or sister in Christ do that. Um, and I've actually had quite a few do that to me. And I love it uh, because I'm not saying I'm always right, right? I may act that way because I'm teaching from the pulpit. We talked about this last week. But if I'm wrong, uh, there's a couple guys I meet with and we talk about this all the time. Uh, I think I'm right, and you think you're right, but let's meet together, and one day one of us is going to figure out, right? And we have coffee together, and we hang out together, and we enjoy each other's company, even though we have differences, and that's completely okay. And so this is kind of what Paul is dealing with here, that the strong ought to bear the weaknesses of the weak and not please ourselves. You know, anytime it's like you're trying to push your what you think is right, and you get angry and mad, you're pleasing yourself. Right? And that's what he's saying here. So let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. And right? now this is great when we think about this neighbor aspect. Who is the neighbor? I love the scripture when it talks about neighbor. Right? The neighbor is anyone that's not just close by location, but close by influence. Right? If you can influence someone, they're your neighbor, right? Or you're their neighbor, right? Uh, Paul says uh, that we are to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And he said, uh, and we, as we have opportunity, to let us do good to all people, especially to those of the household of faith. So those who have influence over in the church are our neighbors. We should bear their burdens. We should lead to their edification, what is good for them, not what we want, what's good for us. So verse number three says, for even Christ did not please himself. But as is written, the insults of those who insulted you fell on me. That's a powerful verse to think about. Jesus, who was right, by the way, I don't know if you know that or not. Right? Every time he spoke, he was right and they were wrong. Think about that, right? And so for every uh, Jew, every uh, uh, Sadducee or Pharisee that he talked to, every priest he talked to, his entire life, he was right, they were wrong. Right? For every time his disciples tried to tell him, well, shouldn't we do it this way? They were wrong. He was right. So if you were someone who knew that everything you say is right, and you knew that everything they were saying was wrong, and you knew it because you created the universe and you spoke these words already, and so you already know what it means, wouldn't you be the person that could say, pretty much stand up and say, shut up, I know what I'm talking about. Right? Couldn't you be the person to finally say a little arrogance like, no, you're wrong, I'm right. Right? But he didn't. 
He didn't please himself. He was here for a purpose to die for us, even though we were wrong. Isn't that crazy to think about that? The way of Christ is the hard road, but when we do, we show the work of Christ on the cross to them. So when we struggle to bear the burdens of the weaker, it's going to be hard. But we do that in showing the work of Christ on the cross. Selfishness has no part in the life of the believer. Paul is not saying that we give it to the weak brother's desires that like they want this so we just give in to them. No, that's not what he's saying. But that we're to act in a way that will bring eternal benefit to them. We literally help them carry the cross of their weakness. And when we do, we show Christ to them. Jesus lived to please God and serve mankind. He died for the strong and he died for the weak. Christ was always going out of his way to bear someone else's burden. He always went the second, third, tenth, twentieth mile. It was the blind, the deaf, the crippled, the sick, right, that he sought out. It was the woman who was caught in adultery that he sought out. It was a woman who was uh, living with a man who had been married five times that he sought out. He sought them out to show them that he loved them and was dying for them, that he's willing to please them over himself. In light of eternity, is a very insignificant thing to bear the suffering of the weak brother in the church when compared to what Christ suffered. Think about that. In light of eternity, they're wrong, you're right. I'm going to prove it to them. Does it matter? In light of eternity, does it matter whether uh, we have close communion or not close communion? <laughs> Right? Let's use that as an example. It doesn't matter whether we use, uh, we, we wear dresses to church or not wear dresses to church. Like in light of, right? In light of eternity, what are the issues that matter? Because when we compare it to what Christ did, some of that just doesn't even matter. Like it's almost not even a blip on my radar in light of what Christ has done. And if we look to God, we, uh, focus on God and give him the glory for all that we do, then things will begin to turn around and show us that maybe we were the weaker brother. Verse number five and six says, now may the God of perseverance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we live out the source, Christ himself, and not from our own desires of the flesh, that's usually what's happening. Right? If we live from the source, Christ, he who is the God of all patience and comfort will give you grace, will give you the ability to live in harmony equal to the life in Christ. This word harmony is a great word. It does not mean uh, uh, that uh, you will suffer as you work alongside each other in differences. It literally means that you have the same mind. So a lot of times we think, oh, uh, they believe differently or they think differently or they're younger, I'm older, uh, they're from a different religion or whatever, you know, maybe they have a different uh, background, you know, and we're going to have to suffer together. The reality is when we're both living from the source of Christ, we live in harmony. So now that way our minds are one in Christ. And that's what matters, right? Our minds are one in Christ. So as we are, have these differences, and we're talking about in light of context, what we saw last week with the Jew and the Gentile, right? The pagan Roman people living with the Jewish uh, faith, they're coming together in the Christian church now following Jesus. And so their, their differences are way different than we can even imagine in our churches. But he's talking about you can walk in harmony. Well, how can I walk in harmony with one who eats pigs? How can I walk in harmony with one who eats beef? That's from the other side. How can I walk in harmony with, with someone who barely wears any clothes to church? How can I walk in harmony that per, someone who's wearing a coat and a cloak and a cover when it's 105 degrees outside? That's just ridiculous, right? So that, that's the, the, the difference. I was just making fun of a few of them. But, but he says we can walk in harmony because that's exactly what he says. How do we walk in harmony? Because we have one mind of Christ. And this will happen automatically. 
You don't need to try hard to live in Christ, right? But as you allow Christ to give you his grace and you yield your life to his leading, what will happen naturally over time is that you'll begin to walk in harmony in Christ. And the reason why this would happen or the purpose of living your life in Christ is so that together the weaker and the strong may have one voice to glorify the God and Father, Jesus Christ. That's our purpose, why we're walking in harmony. So we, we can, with one voice, sing together, speak together, uh, convey the same message together. Right? Sometimes when I have someone fill the pulpit, uh, they'll say, what do you want me to teach on? Jesus. Just speak on Jesus. Because if you speak on Jesus, you won't have a problem. It's when they start going off in the tangents of, other areas of denominational teachings and what they learned and they want to show you how smart they are and whatever. That's when we start finding all these. But no, the, the harmony is going to be in Jesus. I used to tell people that all the time when I lived in Utah. They would come up and visit whatever, you know, I, w- I want you to speak today. And, you know, what do you, when you speak on Jesus, just speak on Jesus. That's all you need to speak on. Okay, and then they start talking about like anti-Mormon stuff. I'm like, We live in Utah, people. I think we know exactly what you're telling us. You live in Texas. You don't need to be teaching us that. Just talk about Jesus, right? And so it's hard sometimes when we uh, want to get off of that track. What did Paul say? I come to you and preach Christ and him crucified and nothing else. right? Because that's the the harmony we're going to find. Now, can we have a study on little small nuances of the Scripture? Absolutely. We do that on Sunday nights and sometimes during our Sunday morning Bible fellowships and sometimes Wednesday nights. You know, sometimes I'll do a message on a small nuance of that. But ultimately, it comes to focus on what is Jesus, is our harmony. It makes sense that when we're both living in Christ and our minds are in harmony on the mind of Christ, that our voices, what we speak to each other, will glorify God. So the opposite is also true. When you live out of your flesh, and your own selfish desires, your own selfish wants, when your life is a, a living a life in bondage to rule-keeping and judgment, you won't have harmony, right? And you will not glorify God. That's why there's so many splits of even just Baptist churches. There's 400 different denominational breaks of the Baptist church in America, right? Why? Because someone got their eyes off of Jesus. They started talking about little nuanced things and started making that the issue. And that shows us that when there's a split, who causes confusion? Not God. Satan's the author of confusion. So when there's confusion and there's struggle and there's splits and there's people running from the church, it's almost always a Satan-led thing. Because they're not focused on Jesus. They're not focused on the harmony of the gospel. And that's the issue. We start thinking of ourselves, not in God. Because he says here, God of all perseverance and encouragement. So if someone wasn't in line with you, if you are following God, don't you think he would lead you to have encouragement and persevere through that? Absolutely. Well, they believe a little different. Are you focused on Jesus? Yeah. Is Jesus aligned? Yep. We believe in the same on G. Okay, good. Let's just move forward with this. We'll deal with this later, but our focus has to be Jesus. Every issue of selfish wants will be eliminated in the church if we all yielded to Christ in our life. Almost every issue of difference in doctrine will also be eliminated in the church if we all yield to Christ's life. No one would get upset over being too cold or too hot. No one would get upset over what songs are sung on Sunday. No one would get upset over what people were wearing. No one would get upset of how soft or how uh, loud the music was. No one would get upset about what Bible version we're using. No one would get upset about how soft or hard the pews are. In fact, I would also think that no one would get upset over even what was taught from the pulpit. Because you may say, hey, Pastor, you're maybe going a little too far there. Pastor, you may be maybe saying something a little wrong. Right? Hear me out. Almost every person who's ever left a church upset over doctrine did not leave as Christ would lead the church. That's not the way Christ did it. And so when we see this aspect, if I'm reading the Bible and you're reading the Bible and we come up with difference of opinion about a specific teaching, it could be that one of us is wrong. It could be that it doesn't matter 
or could be in our present life that the issue may be different in my personal life than it is in your personal life. And I've seen that too. God is showing us something different because we need something specific from him in our life. So one of us could be wrong. We could both be wrong. It just doesn't matter. Or we're both right specifically what's going on in my life and in your life. And so when we think about these, any of these reasons should never make us be angry or mad towards someone else. We should be able to, as Isaiah says, reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Let us come reason together. We should be able to, if Christ is our source, and that's the key, be able to open the Bible together and share our hearts with one another without anger or without getting mad. I will say this, I'm very passionate about God's Word. I say that a lot because I am. And I love to discuss and reason with anyone about why I believe what I believe. I spent years in the bondage of legalism when I was allowed to, uh, and, and I wasn't ever allowed to share what my thoughts were. If I thought differently from the pastor, you could not bring that up to him. So for me, I say, yes, come to me. Now, I will tell you this, don't do it on a Sunday. Because that's the day I'm already going, ah, you know. But come to me and say, hey, pastor, can we meet for coffee? Yeah, let's meet for coffee. And you bring your Bible and you open it up and say, here's what you taught and here's what I believe, whatever. I'm like, oh, man, that's a good point. Let's talk about that. I may say, you know, I believe differently. Then that's okay. Right? And you can say, well, I believe differently. And we can look at the same passage and believe differently about it. And I'd be perfectly okay with that. Who's buying coffee today? I really, truly, that's the way I think. Now, if you catch me on a Sunday, it may not go that way. I'm just being honest, right? And I know that some people are not as passionate. And what I mean by that, passionate, means you're just as passionate, but a lot quieter. <laughs> so, right? That may be softer and quieter in the reasoning. So please, do not confuse my passion with not wanting to reason with you. Just say, shh, my turn to speak. And I'll be quiet. You can even say, shut up. I don't really care. And in the end, we can live in Christ together. We can love each other in Christ. Really, that's... That's how we should be doing it. And, and I don't want it to be just me this way to you, but I want it to be y'all to me and y'all to each other. This is what Scripture is teaching us, right? A little over a year ago, I had someone come to me about a difference in a specific teaching. No one in this church now, so don't be trying to think out who it is, right? All right. And I, in my passionate way, said, awesome, that's great. Let's reason together, right? Let's get back next week, study it out, and come back with Scripture so we can reason together with Scripture. So we came back next week, a week or so later, whatever. I brought my notes because, you know, that's the way I am. I got my notes, whatever. And they come, and they don't have any notes. And they don't even have their Bible. They don't have any notepad. They don't have anything. And I go, okay, what would you come up with? Well, I didn't really get time to do it. No worries. No worries. No big deal. Well, well let's, let's go take a couple more weeks and whatever. Give you some more time. So I'm excited. I want to hear about it. I want to exchange information, right? And uh, a couple weeks come by, and, and uh, we get back to Amanda, and they say, well, I didn't really study it out because it's not going to work anyway. I can't change your mind. And I was kind of hurt by that because I didn't think I said, let's change each other's mind. I just said, let's read some scripture together. And I said, that really isn't the, the point. The point to read some scripture is not to change your mind or change my mind. Is a reason of scripture together and walk away saying both of us may be right, both of us may be wrong, but I want to hear your side. I want to hear it because I want to learn. I read all sorts of books of people that believe differently than I do. I want to learn. And uh, so we never got an opportunity to, to share. Like, that was it. We just, I never brought it up again. And to this day, uh, he and I have never talked about it again, never brought it up again. Um, and uh, they don't go to church here. So, uh, but. The idea is that um, if you want to read some scripture together, let's read some scripture together. And let's talk about it. Let's have some fun. Um, I, I enjoy it, right? And so I, I, uh, I've done this with other people who brought me more pages than I had. And uh, I said, okay, I'll, give me a couple of weeks. Go back through all the notes you have here, right? They were wrong still, but um, <laughs> just kidding. All right. But even if someone feels their beliefs of a specific doctrine was so different that they needed to leave the church because of it, they would always leave with grace, 
with kindness, with love, edifying the church and bringing glory to God the whole time. I read this this week, and I want to share it with you, and I, and I don't know why it just popped on my feed this week, but I think God had a, a message for it. It said, never, ever fire a parting shot as you leave a church, even if setting their record straight would be temporarily satisfying. Protecting the bride of Christ is more important than your feelings. And that is so true. So often, someone wants to leave the church because almost never from a doctrinal reason. It's usually by a personality difference. And in order to make it sound like God's in it, they'll fire a shot back typically to the pastor so that way the people say, oh, he had a reason. God must be in it. God would never do it that way. So when I see that and I saw this come up and I was thinking about this, God is a God of all perseverance and encouragement. And he will grant us to live in harmony with one another in accordance to Christ. So does that mean every person that you have struggled with with personality, you can live in harmony with in Christ? Absolutely. If both of you desire that Christ is your focus and your source of life. And that's the point. Leaving a church for any reason and anger or bitterness will not bring glory to God, no matter how much you say, God led me. God will never lead anyone to leave in anger or bitterness. It will not edify his church. It will not edify uh, others. And it will not glorify God. May the Lord of God of patience give us grace to live in harmony with one another with the mind of Christ so that we will glorify the God with one voice. This is and always should be the goal in every single uh, believer in Christ communing together. Verse number seven. Therefore, welcome one another just as Christ also welcomed us for the glory of God. Wow. We looked at that word welcome before, right? Because of the purpose to glorify God in Christ, welcome one another. Take action to bring others into the harmony and glory of Christ. In other words, they're weaker, you're stronger. You're weaker, they're stronger. doesn't matter. Welcome them means you go and make the effort to bring them in. They make the effort to bring you in, and now you walk in harmony. Welcome one another just as Christ welcomed us. He did the effort on the cross for us. He went and took us out of the darkness and brought us to light. We're to do the exact same thing with those that we have differ in. We're to walk across the aisle to make it hard, to, to make the effort, not just like, hey, I'm here. If they want to come talk to me, I'll be here. No, we walk over and say, let's reason together. Let's talk. Come over. We're welcome together. Let's walk in harmony together. You make the effort. If they make the effort, you make the effort, you will automatically begin to walk in harmony with Christ. That's what Scripture tells us. Verse number 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcised on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs and that the Gentiles might glorify God in his mercy. Paul had been talking about non-essential matters, things of diet, specific holy days, and Paul is very much a peacemaker on these areas of non-essential areas. He was willing to be all things to all men, the kingdom of Christ to come and be glorified. But when it comes to the issue of the truth of the gospel, he would be unmovable. Love must be shown with mercy to the weaker brethren, but also show truth that the same love and mercy compromise to truth isn't love at all. So here's the thing is, we can differ on little small things of the gospel, I mean, of, of the, the Bible. We can differ on preferences, and we can differ on all those things. But again, our harmony is in Jesus so we got to at least line with that, right? Is Jesus God? Yes. Okay, we're in line with so far, right? Did Jesus die for our sins? Yes. Okay, we're, we're going in the right direction. Did he die on a cross and three days later rose again? Yes. We're go okay, we're all on the same page here, right? He rose again to give us eternal life. Yes. And to have faith in Christ as our Savior is how we achieve eternal life. Yes. Okay, right. we're all on the same page, right? That's the Jesus path. So if someone said, no, I don't believe Jesus is God, we might need to stop and let's have a conversation. I don't believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Let's stop and let's have a conversation. We can't walk in harmony if we're not on the same page with Jesus. I used to have conversations when I was in Utah. I said, let's have a conversation about Jesus. 
All right. And for this story, let's call your Jesus Joe and my Jesus Fred. And they're like, okay. So tell me about Joe. And they would be describing who Joe is. And I would describe Fred. And we had completely two different descriptions. Right? So your Joe is not the same as my Fred. So your Jesus isn't the same as my Jesus. That's a good point. I never thought of it that way. So we're not in harmony. So when we're talking those things, sometimes it's smart to sit down and let's, let's talk about the big issues. So if someone comes to you and starts talking about women wearing pants or what Bible version or what songs or what, you know, all those, those are just sub areas out there, right? Like, come on. Like, do you celebrate Christmas? I want to know that. Do you celebrate Halloween? And like, you know, you start getting into all these trivial things out here and like, okay, let's go back. Let's talk about Jesus. And, and this is kind of what he's saying. Jesus Christ has been the servant to the circumcised on behalf of the truth of God. So the truth is important that the, the Jesus died for the truth, and he died for salvation for all. So Paul said, look, we're on the same page on that. And he knows that these Gentile believers and these Jewish believers have believed in Jesus for that purpose. So that's unmovable. That doesn't mean you have to be rude about it. You can still present it with the grace and love of Christ. Let's talk about Jesus. If someone doesn't agree with you on Jesus, that's fine. They don't have to, you, no one has to be forced to believe Jesus the way you believe Jesus. If they don't believe in Jesus, that's okay. That's why we have free will, right? You don't have to be angry and hate them like, oh, I can't talk to you. Right? You can still have coffee with someone who doesn't believe in Jesus. Did you know that? I, I, I would say you can still have cake and ice cream, but I can't eat cake and ice cream. So it's unsugared coffee and unsweet tea, right? So <laughs> You, you, can, you can have a hamburger with someone who doesn't believe in Jesus, right? But it doesn't mean you're going to align in harmony and walk in harmony in Christ together. All right? So there has to be a line. So in the church, this is where the line comes in, right? Someone walk into the church and they go, hey, pastor, I feel like I, I used to teach at that church over there and I like to teach at your church. Wonderful. Let's talk about what you believe in Jesus. And if they believe different than Jesus, well, they might not be teaching. <laughs> Right? Because I'm not going to have someone, yeah, get up there and talk about Jesus. And they start talking about Fred. <laughs> and we're like, whoa, what? that's not what we believe, right? Now, if he gets up there and starts talking about women wearing dresses, we're like, ah, we know about that. He's the weaker brother. Let's, let's love him in patience, right? <laughs> we're going to bear his burden for a day, right? But when we're talking about Jesus, this is what he's talking about. So there is a, there is a line, and, and I don't want people to think that just because we have to be graceful and loving, whatever, that we can let people run over us. No, we can, we can stand up for truth. But understand the truth you're standing up for is what is truth in God's word, not your preferences or your opinions. And that's really what we're seeing here. Continue on there in uh, verse number 13. And may God, the God of hope, fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul has proved his point. He has upheld the rights of the strong and the weak brother. He has shown that the stronger should give way to the weaker. He has shown that love will express itself in mercy when showing truth. Paul then concludes this section by praying that the Jew and Gentile in Christ will get along despite their differences. In Christ, we have assurance. In Christ, we have joy. In Christ, we have peace and hope. These all bind all believers to love, understanding, and edifying one another through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what Paul's talking about. The way to harmony in the church of God is not easy. People are different. We're all saved from different backgrounds, racial and religious backgrounds, social and education backgrounds, age backgrounds. It is expected that people of different ages and different temperaments, different abilities, different drives, different concepts, different opinions, it's expected that they'll struggle with one another. Expect that walking to the church. Know that that's going to happen and be okay with it. But we can, over time, with Christ as our focus, walk in harmony. It cannot be done by our own flesh. I try to like that person over there. Right? We can't do it in our own flesh. It has to be done through Christ and his grace. The thing that unites us are far greater than the things that divide us. We're united in Christ together through his blood. Now, teenagers, and I don't mean to, uh, uh, you know, 
call out the teenagers here because there's some of you. But teenagers have a thing about they looked at me funny, right? You remember that as a young child? Do you know where they learned that from? Parents. You know why I know that? Because when parents are talking to the six-year-old uh, or the five-year-old or the four-year-old, they look at them and like, don't look at your mother that way, right? We just taught them that a look can make me angry. So by the time they're 15, 16, they're like, looks make me angry, right? Where'd they learn that from? And then they give the looks to their parents, the roll the eye thing, right? My daughter was great at that. The roll the eye thing. Man. She's like, look, I don't do drugs. I don't do things I'm not supposed to do. I don't drink. I have great grades. What are you so mad about? That roll an eye thing right there. <laughs> why, why does the look anger us so much, right? Because we perceive what that look means. And often that look doesn't mean what we think it means. People have facial expressions that may look really mean, but they're just smiling the inside. <laughs> so when we're thinking about God and us walking together, if we are saying, hey, I don't know if you're going to walk in harmony, that person, they look at me funny. I'm like, really? And I, and I say that because I've actually heard Christians in church say that. Well, I was going to go say hi to her, but she looked at me funny, so i like, oh my word, really? Are we 12? But that's the way we view things. Like, who cares? Walk up to them, give them a big hug, and say, I love you, and welcome to the church, right? So it can be done if we walk in harmony with Christ. That's the goal. Verse 14. Now I myself am persuaded concerning you, my brothers, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and also be able to instruct one another. In other words... He's beginning to summarize his letter, and he's starting off with a good positive, right? Guys, I get you. I love your heart. I know that y'all have a good heart. I know you want what's best, right? I know you're filled with all knowledge. That's wonderful, and you're able to teach one another. But, right, because you know that's coming, right? He wants them to know, look, I, I know you have a good heart, and I know you want what's best for the church, and I know what, what you're doing. I used to tell this to uh, a guy in Kansas. He, he would fight me on everything he wanted to fight me on, and I just looked at him. I said, I understand your heart. What do you mean? Everything you're saying you're fighting on is trying to protect the church that you grew up in. You're trying to protect your church. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not just your church. It's Christ's church. And he wants to protect this church way more than you do. And there's other people here that want to protect the church just as much as you do. So let's work together to protect the church, what's really important. And by the way, the pews, the walls, the windows, the air conditioning is not the part to protect. That's not the church. Right? So he finally kind of got it. He was still fighting on stuff. But we have a tendency to want to protect the church. And Paul's saying, hey, I know you have a good heart. You're filled with goodness. You have a lot of knowledge. That's great. You also can instruct one another. But, nevertheless, that's what he says, right? Brothers or sisters, I have written even more boldly to you on some points to remind you because of the grace that is given to me from God. However, <laughs> I had to come to you strong and clear on a certain few areas to remind you what I've already taught you, that because of the grace of God, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, so that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable to you, seeing as how you are too sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, I had to come strong at you a little bit. Sorry. I hope I didn't hurt your feelings. But y'all needed to hear this truth. Stop judging each other. Stop picking on each other. Stop hurting each other. For the good of God and the good of each other and the glory of God and His church, live in harmony with one another. Romans verse 17 says, In Christ Jesus, therefore, I have reason to boast in my service to God, for I will not dare to speak of anything except that Jesus Christ has accomplished through me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. Christ has been his motivation in all that he's done. He continues to say in the next few verses to bring up uh, things that he has done through Christ for the purpose of preaching to the Gentiles, that they may be saved and that all that is done will fulfill Scripture. He tells them that this is what had been done so fervently. This is why he was so passionate about what he did. 
that he has kept him from actually becoming to come to Rome. He said, I want to come to Rome so badly, but because I'm uh, working so hard at, at uh, writing all these letters and, and fighting against people that are against me, even though we're all in the same faith, this is crazy, but I want to get to Rome, but I haven't been able to get to you yet. And his conclusion in wrapping up this letter in verses 30, he asked the church in Rome to bind together as they pray for him that he will uh, be able to come to them because he's first going to Jerusalem and he's going to be fighting against the unbelievers in Jerusalem and that they may lay hold on him. So pray for me that I would get to Rome, that I can get safe. I want to go through Spain and get to Rome, that's what he says, but I had to go to Jerusalem first. And if you know the story of Acts, Paul went to Jerusalem and he gets arrested, right? So exactly what he's saying, pray for me about, this is what's going on. Now, the believers in Jerusalem had similar beliefs about the Gentiles, but he's had to go to them and say, hey, remember these Gentiles, we're all one, so hopefully they got it right, so at least we can bind together. Well, he got to Jerusalem, they were still struggling with it. The, the, the believers in Jerusalem were still saying, no, I don't think the Gentiles can be, and he's still having to fight that battle, right? So he includes this section and this phrase in verse 33. Now the God of peace be with you all, amen. So this is a, a blessing of the, of the faith back then. May the God of peace be with you all. We know that God is with them, right? And we know that they have the peace of God with them. But it's a, a prayer, a blessing. It's a blessing to the church in Rome as he was head of Jerusalem, fighting danger and battle and hatred and, and arrest. But he was walking in perfect peace because he knew the God of peace. And he said, the God of my peace that I have, I want you to have that same peace. I'm going to go through all these struggles I know what's about to happen. And I want you who are living in the church in Rome that's struggling as well to also walk in that harmony and that same peace. He desired the same confidence in them as they struggled together in their faith. So the question that's asked by me today, and it's really the same question I've been asking every Sunday of the series, is this. Do you believe what you're reading and hearing? Do you believe the book of Romans as we're going through it? Are you believing what you're hearing? Do you believe without a doubt that Christ died for you to take away your sins, to redeem you, and he was raised again to give you his righteousness. If you do, then you get to walk in the peace of the, of the, uh, with the other brothers. You get to walk in the harmony that Christ has as you believe these things together. So go live a life that is in Christ and his righteousness together in harmony. That's what he's saying. If you don't believe these truths, why? What's holding you back from being filled with a love that comes from Christ? the gift of everlasting life, and the gift of amazing grace. Don't let the struggles of this life hold you back from grasping this truth. Don't let the struggles between two believers that you're seeing, like, I don't be a Christian because look at those two Christians, right? Don't let what they're doing keep you from receiving victory in Christ. You can go around them and become the stronger brother that quick if you believe God's word. Trust in Christ as your Savior today, and he will give you life, eternal life, his righteousness, and his peace of mind. Christ is our righteousness. Without him, we are lost. We will live in bitterness and anger, but with him, we walk in harmony and peace. We are righteous in Christ today because of his wonderful, amazing, eternal, redemptive plan. Let's walk in harmony in Christ as we focus on him and him alone, Christ and him crucified, walk in harmony with him. Stand with me this morning as we celebrate his righteousness in prayer and song.